Hey everybody, it's Matt Colville. Welcome back. We are going to make a fighter in every edition of Dungeons & Dragons. I apologize for the delay between the last two videos. Uh, in my defense, I can only say that I have been working very hard on a new video game, Evolve, from Turtle Rock Studios. Evolve's a fantastic game. I am the writer. There are a lot of characters, and there's a lot of writing to be done. So I've been crunching pretty hard on this game, as have the rest of my co-workers. And in my spare time, my copious spare time, <laughs> that's a joke, I have been working on Thief, the sequel to my first novel, Priest, both of which are available on Amazon.com. But this isn't an ad. I'm not trying to sell you on the book, although I think if you play D&D or you're watching these videos, you would probably get a kick out of these books. They're sort of hard-boiled fantasy. Uh, but I'm merely offering this as an explanation to those people who have been spamming my inbox, asking me how long it takes to make one of these videos. Holy crap, it's been like a month. Well, it doesn't take that long, frankly, but I've got a lot of stuff in the pike. And so we return. Let us leave 2014 behind and let us journey back to the year 1979. 1979 is when the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook came out. Look at that spectacular cover, isn't that... I love that cover, and I feel as though it does a pretty good job of communicating what this game is about. You will note that these heroes in this picture are not saving the world. They are killing a couple of innocent lizard men and stealing the gems from their god's idol. And I think that says a lot about how this game is played. It's sword and sorcery. It's not a heroic fantasy. This book came out in 1979, and there's an interesting little bit of timeline here. The Monster Manual for this edition of the game came out in 1978, which meant the Monster Manual came out first, and then a year later the Player's Handbook came out, and that seems strange to me. My only thought is that there were lots of people already playing D&D &D based on videos 1 and 2, and so were able to use all of the monsters in the Monster Manual in their game. But it gets even weirder because the rules for creating a character are not completely contained within this book. You need the Dungeon Master's Guide, which wouldn't come out for another year, 1980. 1980 is also when the basic edition of the game came out, video number three. And I wanted to return to that for a moment because I missed something fairly important that some people were gracious enough to point out. And that is this. Ability score adjustments. Once I was done making Duncan the Third. I had the option to change his stats. Remember in uh, the basic edition of D&D, video number three, like video number one and two, we are rolling 3d6 in order to determine our stats. And at this point, between 1976 Greyhawk and 1979 Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, it began to be obvious that that was not the best way to make characters for a lot of reasons, and I think we're going to find out why as we go through this video. And so there was sort of a branch in D&D &D between basic and advanced as to how to solve that problem. In basic D&D, &D, the solution was you're going to continue just rolling 3d6 in order, but when you're done, you can dock and add. You can lower some stats in order to raise others. Now, which ones you can raise and lower are are very specific. It's not up. You can't raise and lower just any. For instance, constitution and charisma may not be raised or lowered. Why not? Well, if you could lower your charisma, you would. You would give yourself a cripplingly low charisma. Although I use the phrase crippling or the word crippling, when in fact there wasn't really any reason to have a high charisma or a low charisma, especially in basic D and D. The notion of a charisma-based character one that actually used his charisma stat mechanically, wouldn't come around for another 25, 26 years, 2000, so whenever 4th edition was released, and you started to get characters like the Paladin and the Warlock, which I think is great design, don't get me wrong, I think they're a lot of fun and brilliant, but the reason you can't lower your characters here is because you don't have anything to do with your charisma. The idea being, you are raising and lowering your prime requisite, the stat that is important to your class. You can raise your strength if you're a fighter by lowering your intelligence wisdom. In other words, you can become a better fighter by becoming less wizardy or less cleric-y and vice versa. The ratio here is two to one. So if I take two points out of my intelligence, I can put one more point into strength. So let's take a look at Duncan the Third. How would he be different? Oh, Duncan the Third, how I've missed you. 
you had an eight strength and a 13 intelligence. So I could, is there a limit to how far? I bet there is. There should be. I hope there is. Otherwise, I could be somewhere. Ah, when adjusting abilities, no score may be lowered below nine. Okay, that's smart. Because otherwise, I would lower it to three and I would have a moron as a character. How would you be able to tell the difference between the moron the character and the moron the player? I know you're asking. But that's sarcastic and mean. Why would you say that? Uh, intelligence of 13. If I bring it down to 9, that saves me 4 points. I could convert 4 divided by 2 is 2, which would get me a 10 strength. That would remove my penalty to hit and damage. But I don't know if I would have done that when I was, let's say, 10 or 12. Probably, yeah, I probably would have, actually. Uh, that's ridiculous. I would have done everything I could to get my strength up as high as possible. Now, looking back, I think I probably would find the minus one to hit not that big a deal. Or remember video number three where we talk about how as you play the game, you're going to get items very quickly. You're going to get gear, magical gear, that will negate these penalties. Whereas having a 13 intelligence is kind of neat. It means uh, Duncan III could speak lots of languages. Curious to see how he compares to Duncan IV. So that's the method for getting your character sort of out of the realm of peasants and into the realm of heroes. The implication being, and this is important I think, is that this method for making characters, right, which is rolling 3d6 and taking the, uh, and just putting them in order, is how everyone in the world, uh, peasants and kings and scullery maids and, you know, uh, farmers, how they all generated their stats. And the heroes in 1974, 1976 weren't any different. They were just, you're literally a farmer who put down his plowshare and picked up a sword. Whereas around 1977, 78, it began to be obvious that your character should be better than a normal schmuck because he is, uh, he's a hero. And so this is the method, Doc and Ad, that they used in basic D&D, and we'll find out how they did it in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Let's take, a look at, uh, let's take a look at our blank character sheet first. Uh, Duncan IV. Now you're going to notice that I've already, I've already created sort of a blank character sheet here for him, and each stat has some interesting little uh, modifiers, oops, modifiers attached to it. We're going to find out what those mean. There's quite a lot of them, because the characters got pretty complex once we got to Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, at least compared to, for instance, 1974, where your entire character could fit in on a 3x5 card. Duncan's name, Duncan the Fourth. His class is still fighter, and I believe we still have a level title, so he is still a veteran. And now let's see what the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook has to say about how to make our dude. One of the things I like doing is reading the preface, because I find you learn a lot about the, what the people who wrote this were thinking, in this case Gary Gygax. In 1978-79 when he was writing this, and there's an interesting point here where he talks about the burden of becoming the guy everyone playing the game looked to to determine what is D D. and he says here that in writing uh this this book he has set himself the final arbiter of fantasy role playing in the minds not his mind in the minds of the majority of D D players in other words he has realized everybody playing this game is sending me letters and some in some cases literally calling me on the phone and saying, hey, I need you to answer this question. And Gary's attitude was always like, well, you're as good a GM as I am. You answer the question. And that the rules that you had in 1974, 1976 weren't especially authoritative. They, weren't, they didn't come down from on high. It was just the stuff that Gary and his friends thought was cool. Uh, but he's giving up, basically, and saying, fine. I'll, I, it's been now five years since that game came out. And I am aware of the fact that people... People think I, Gary Gygax, am the guy, am the dude in charge of all this crap. So, fine. Uh, and as a result, there are a ton of rules. Like, how does Wolfsbane affect lycanthropy and really noodly stuff in the Player's Handbook and the DM's Guide that I think probably Gary would not have put in there were it not for five years of people pestering him and not taking his advice, not getting it. Just make it up. Come up with your own explanation. There's no reason your version of the game has to work the same as mine. Although, as with a lot of stuff, there's a little bit of a contradiction there, as we will see. He calls himself, he says, it, it, who better? He says, fine, if you're going to ask me to be the final arbiter of fantasy role-playing, fine, I will take on that burden. And then he adds, who better to do that 
because he considers himself the first proponent of fantasy gaming. And that's an interesting claim to make. But I've been reading, as I mentioned in one of the earlier videos, a great book by John Peterson called Playing at the World. I'll put a link to it in the About box. It's a very dry, academic history of wargaming and D&D. It's not a fun, breezy read, but it is meticulously researched. And one of the things that he points out is that well before Chainmail or D&D or any of that stuff, back in the 60s, there were two essential branches of wargaming. One was miniature wargaming with painted lead, and the other one was wargaming like very complex board games where you used chits and there were cardboard chits and there were maps and the maps were kind of like a board and Gary, there was a large community of players. There were several magazines that came out supporting both of these kinds of war gaming and Gary was active in all of them. And he was a huge proponent, the first proponent of fantasy war gaming way before there was role playing. He was the guy saying, hey, fantasy wargaming can be as much fun as any other kind. And that was considered somewhat heretical. He was, you know, he was the cause of the first uh, grognards, as we call them, which are the older gamers who complain at what the newer gamers are playing. It's taken from a term that uh, Napoleon's old serving regular soldiers would use complain or grumble about the new guys and that uh, the grumbling in French was turned into grognard. They were the grognards. And so these older gamers in the sixties thought that miniature war gaming should be Napoleonics or uh, if not Napoleonics or like civil war stuff, then you go way back to uh, like the Roman times and the Macedonians. And there wasn't really any market back then for medieval wargaming. Gary was the first proponent of that and then went on to be a huge proponent of fantasy wargaming. And so he felt like, hey, I earned this. And there's a lot of controversy regarding who created what when it comes to D&D, Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson. I think Dave Arneson, based on what I've read, had a, a huge influence on the way the game was played. And at that time, especially, a lot of the rules were really just tradition among the players. Whereas Gary really was the author of fantasy wargaming in that respect, and by association, fantasy role-playing. So he calls himself the first proponent of fantasy gaming, and I am inclined to, to grant him that title. He goes on to say there's a need for a certain amount of uniformity from campaign to campaign. Why? Why would he say that? Why does he care? Well, I think because back then they imagined all of these campaigns, your campaign, my campaign, Lisa's campaign that she was running in New Hampshire, uh, Froderick's campaign that he's running in Germany, that they all were taking place in essentially the same world, the same fantasy world, and that a character from one game should be able to... Be, I should be able to play in your game and Phil's game and take my character from one to the other. That only works if we're all basically using the same rules. And specifically what Gary's talking about is the rate of advancement, which means how much treasure and experience is awarded. And that was a big bugaboo back then was that some, especially very young, game masters would award their players ridiculously powerful magic items, huge vaults of treasure, and those were called Monty Hall campaigns, and they were one of the things that Gary hated because you might think, I think now, like, hey, why not? If you're having fun, you're 13, who cares? Just do it. Eventually, you'll figure it out. That's not the best way to play. But one of the things I think that frustrated Gary was that people would come into his game or his friends' games with these ridiculous characters and say, oh, yeah, I'm third level, but my GM uh, gave me Thor's hammer, so now I have that. And that would frustrate these guys, and they didn't really have a mechanism via which to fight that as long as you assume we're all playing in the same campaign world. Eventually, 4th edition would actually pull that off. Your characters in 4th edition D&D are genuinely portable and can be taken from one campaign to the next. But uh, back, back in 1979, there weren't any rules for that. It was just an assumption they all made. There's a very interesting statement here where you learn a lot about what people were arguing about in the late 70s when it came to D&D. Gary says, You will find no pretentious dictums herein, no baseless limits arbitrarily placed on female strength or male charisma, no ponderous combat systems for greater, quote, realism. There isn't a hint of a spell point system whose record-keeping would warm the heart of a monomaniacal statistics lover or anything else of that sort. That's Gary's slam against the things people were complaining about. They would complain that 
girl characters should have statistically on average lower strength than boy characters. And then I guess the the obverse was true for charisma. That seems, they, they both seem pretty ridiculous to me given the context of this. No ponderous combat systems for greater realism. In other words, there was a huge explosion of like hit location tables. Like I want to aim for that guy's eye. Whereas D and D always assumed even from the very beginning, it always assumed you're always trying to aim for the heart or the eye. There, you don't need to make a called shot. You're automatically doing everything you can to hit as well as you can. And that further, greater detail would only slow things down to no greater benefit. That was Gary's attitude all along, and I think he was generally correct. Uh, he talks about spell point systems because he's using what's called the Vancean magic system, where your character would memorize spells at the beginning of the day, and every time, spell formulas, every time he cast one, he would forget that formula. It's like if you made a recipe, okay, I'm going to memorize how do I make how do I make egg salad sandwich? I take two eggs, I, put, I use some mayonnaise, I, and then I make the sandwich, I eat the sandwich, and I forget how to make an egg salad sandwich. That doesn't make any sense. Why did I forget that? Well, because that's how it worked in the Jack Vance fantasy series. And Gary thought that was neat. He was well aware that you could use spell points or other systems. I think he just felt that those were kind of mundane and made it less magical, made it less interesting, made it less fantastical. And he liked the idea of this weird, arcane, abstruse spellcasting system. And he tells you so right here. Uh, And then he goes on to say, after all is said and done, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons is a game. Is it really? Because here you say Advanced Dungeons & Dragons is a world, and that's what I was talking about when I meant that I think Gary and those guys just took it for granted that everyone's campaign were happening in the same world, so the characters could move between one and the other. He also says that it that the best description for the game is swords and sorcery. Remember the cover? It's about uh, Conan. If you haven't read the Conan books and you're listening to this, I very strongly recommend it. They're a blast. They're a lot of fun to read. They're they're not novels. They're short stories. You can get them collected very easily uh, on Amazon.com. And they tell you exactly how the game was played. Conan, you know, sees a tall tower in the middle of town and says, hey, what's in that tower? And somebody says, a lot of treasure, but you can't get to it. And he's like, I'm going to give it a shot. Because, why? Because there's a lot of treasure. And so he's a thief. Conan is essentially a thief. So are our characters, essentially. We're going we're gonna to pillage and loot and steal the treasure from the dungeons and temples that we find. So mote it be. All right, so notice that now each participant in the campaign created by the referee must create one or more game personas. So now it's up to us to make our characters. It didn't used to be. It used to be the DM who made the character, and I made an argument for why that might be a good idea. But here now it's up to us. Here's an explanation of, remember I mentioned that eventually Gary would kind of go insane with the term level. He was afraid that people would get level confused because we say level, your character has a level, the dungeon has a level, your spells have a level, and the monster has a level. And he's like, well, you know, maybe we could have used rank for your for your level so you're a third rank fighter you know uh in the second level of the dungeon and he's a casting a third power spell against a seventh order monster and he actually pitches that as arguably the better way to do it and then goes on to say but everyone already uses level all the time anyway so i guess i've already lost that battle When in fact, there was no problem at all. That's why everybody was using it all the time. He could have saved himself. What is this, half a page? That's quite a lot of text, just to make that point. And now it's time to make our character. Uh, Here it says, the premise of the game is that each player character is above average. That didn't used to be true. You You were exactly average in 1974, 1976. Uh, It's not until Advanced Dungeons & Dragons and Basic D&D that you have the opportunity to be above average. Gary says it is essential to the character's survival to be exceptional with a rating of 15 or above in no fewer than two ability characteristics. I don't think we knew that when I was playing back in. When did I start playing? I started playing. In fact, we can find out exactly when I started playing because I first joined the game after this Dragon magazine came out. Because my friends, when I sat down at the table, said, oh, you should play one of those new paladins that is in uh, the new Dragon magazine. They came out with like uh, eight new paladin classes, one for every alignment. When did this magazine come out? 
This magazine came out in February of 1986, and we're going to come back here because there's an interesting example of what kind of stuff characters get when they level up in this magazine. So I started in February, sorry, February, March, probably, of 1986. I would have been 15 years old. And certainly at no point when we were playing AD, and so 15, 16, 17, I don't ever remember the GM giving us a mulligan in character creation if we didn't have at least two 15s. So that was something, you know, like a lot of this stuff I never read, we never used. I suspect a lot of players didn't because we all have very interesting memories of how the game was played back then. Now, it doesn't actually tell us how to make a dude. It says, hey, you should make a guy, and his stats are going to be between 3 and 18. Go look in the Dungeon Master's Guide to figure out how to do it, and the Dungeon Master's Guide wouldn't come out for another year. That seems like a huge bait and switch to me, but what do I know? So let's go look at the DM's Guide and find out how to make our dude. So here in the Dungeon Master's Guide, we are given several different methods for making a character. The first method, the basic method, the one that... Gary assumed everybody would use is you roll 4d6 and you drop the lowest die. You don't count it. You only add the three highest dice and then you place those in whatever order you want to get the character that you want. And that's a huge, that's a pretty substantial difference. In fact, let's see exactly how big a difference is it. This is the chart for uh, 3d6 here in gold and then 4d6. And look at this huge area here between these two graphs and how much more likely you are to get a 13 or higher in the 46 method. So you're going to get, you know, although, yeah, you're going to get, on average, you can, st you can still have a three, but statistically you're going to get a much better character here in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons than you would have in any other method. And before we roll to see what Duncan's stats are, what are the other stats? What were our other options? Uh, all scores are recorded at, and arranged as a method one. Uh, but 3d6 are rolled 12 times, and the highest six scores, so you're just going to roll your stats 12 times. And instead of taking 46 and dropping the lowest, you're going to only roll 3d6, like you used to, but you're going to do it 12 times to get six decent scores. Uh, alternatively, method three, you're going to roll 3d6 six times for each ability. So you're going to roll, for to find out your strength, you're going to roll 3d6 six times. That seems like a ridiculous amount of dice. It's a lot of dice. 3d6 rolled six times for strength, and then again for another six times for intelligence and wisdom and dexterity. Method four, you're going to roll 3d6 six times, like you're making a dude in 1974. You're going to do it in order, just like 1974, but you're going to make 12 dudes. Then you're going to pick the guy you like. Wow, that's a lot of rolling. Now, at this point, around method three, I start to think, why not just give me points to spend? So it's impossible. So I will get at least two fifteens. Why? Or give me a give me a list of give me the give me a list of stats. Give me a a sixteen and two fourteens, and a, you know, and say place them where you want, because this is an awful lot of die rolling just to get to at least two fifteens. And later editions of the game would do exactly what I suggest. They would say you can build your character using points, and that way all characters are equally balanced, and you'll get you'll get the scores that you need to play the character you want. But, you know, looking back, I played this game for years, rolling my stats randomly, and it's an awful lot of fun. It's a blast to generate character randomly. So let's do it. Let's use method one and find out what are Duncan's stats. So ladies and gentlemen, here we go. This is the first time we are rolling 4d6, and we're going to drop the lowest die and only add the top three. One, two, three, four. And what do we get? 14. Not bad. So let's write down here. Uh, before I write down my stats, I'm going to write 14. Before I place them, I'll write them down. 14 is my first one. Second one. One, two, three, four. Oh, wow. 15. So I'm, uh, notice if I'm automatically doing a lot better than Duncan did. Duncan won two or three. And I'm, I'm halfway to having at least two 15s. One, two, three, four. 12. Okay, fine. You know. See, to me now, looking at my first two stats, that seems like a bad roll to me. Isn't that interesting? One, two, three, four. And that is, let's see, five and four is nine, four is so 13. So we don't yet have two 15s. We have two more stats to generate. One, two, three, four. Wow, Duncan, you have an 18, and it's going to go in your strength. Holy carp. Wow, yeah. See, now, I mean... In a sense, this isn't statistically significant. This is only one character, but this character, Duncan the Fourth, would smoke 
Duncan's one, two, and three all put together probably in a fight. Uh, in fact, I think I'm going to get something special for that 18. I, I promise. By the way, this is not edited. I, I, I could have gotten, I've, I could have not gotten anything above a nine. I'm purely, I'm recording the video as you hear it. Uh, I edit out all my, all my belches and uh, any, uh, any cat meowing that uh, you might hear. But uh, otherwise, this is the straight dope. So let's see, what is my sixth and last stat? This is going to be the terrible one, right? Watch. Uh, five and four is nine, and three is 12. Okay, so I got another 12. Well, I met Gary's requirement. First time I met Gary's requirement that I have at least two 15s. Now it's time for me to place these. I'm certainly going to put my strength. We know, we know how to make a fighter now. I'm going to put my strength in 18. It is my prime requisite. I'm going to put my next highest stat, my 15, into my dexterity in the hopes that I get some benefit to my armor class. My constitution is going to be 14. I don't think that's high. I think you need a 16 before you start getting a bonus to your hit points. And then I've got two 12s and a 13. At that point, it's just a question of am I smarter or wiser or charismatic? And since I don't think it matters, I would like to be charismatic. I've always wanted to be charismatic. Here we go. Wisdom is going to be 12, and my intelligence is 12. So fascinatingly... Duncan is average as far as intelligence and wisdom goes and above average in everything else compared to the peasants out in the world who use 3d6 and I have an 18 strength. Holy crap. I am going to kick butt. So coming back to the player's handbook, it explains that if I have a strength of 16 or more, I get a bonus of 10% to my earned experience. You remember that stronger fighters get better faster than weaker fighters which still seems a little weird to me. Furthermore, fighters with an 18 strength are entitled to roll percentile dice in order to generate a random number between 1 and 100. Now, the earlier Duncans did not have that, but we covered why that was. This is the patch. This is the, the 18 percentile strength. In other words, creating this space above between 18 and 19, which didn't exist before, was the first patch to D&D, and it gave fighters uh, an opportunity to compete with wizards because wizards can do, eventually wizards can do, they can stop time and, you know, bend reality. And fighters need a way to keep up, and this is it. So I'm going to roll. This is, by the way, if you've, I don't know if it's coming across in the video, but getting an 18 when you're rolling, only fighters get uh, percentile strength. So it doesn't matter what class I'm playing. If I put an 18 in strength, the best I can do is look at this row, or that's not easy to make rows in this PDF, but the 18 row, I'd be plus one to hit plus two to damage. But now I'm going to roll percentile dice. And at this point, I am, this was the, this was the moment where you were dying to find out so much, so much road on what happened. So I have a little, a little thing here where I can roll percentile dice in fantasy grounds. Ready? Here we go. 37. 37 is not that great. What we want, the magic number was 1800, uh, which is to say if I had rolled 100 on those percentile dice. But I didn't. I rolled 18. Well, actually, I think the classic way was slash 1837. So let's look on the chart and see what 1837 strength gets us. See, that's just one step up from a normal everyday 18. So I'm now going to be plus one to hit, plus three to damage. I have a weight allowance. A, a, a sharp viewer pointed out in my earlier videos that this weight that you see here is not in pounds. 1800 doesn't mean I can, I can carry an extra 3,000 pounds. I can't highlight that 3,000, sorry. It means that uh, because this, these numbers are expressed in gold pieces. That's the weight under weight allowance. And it says so right here. It's given in the number of gold pieces above and beyond the maximum. So whatever normal is, which I don't know, uh, Duncan IV can carry a thousand more gold pieces than normal. And when you think about it for a minute, the reason that they're measuring it in gold pieces, the reason weight, reason weight and everything else is measured in gold pieces is because that's what you're going to spend a lot of your time carrying around. You're going into dungeons to find gold pieces. So why have to convert pounds of carrying capacity into the weight of a gold piece? Let's just w measure everything in gold piece weight. Uh, also, keep in mind, we're still, uh, this is how the game was played, of, of the hitting, damaging, and carrying stuff, equally important was opening doors and bending bars. Apparently, we did a lot of opening doors and bending bars. And this is another place in which the design of Dungeons & Dragons is a little weird, and I often think of it as being undesigned. Uh, because, open, first of all, opening doors and bending bars seems awfully similar to me. I don't know why you would need two different columns for them. And notice how here I have a, a one in three chance. On, and this is on a six-sided die. So that's a 50% chance. But they didn't put 
They put one to three and told you to roll a six-sided die. Whereas here under Ben Barger's lift gates, they actually spell out percentile chance and tell you to roll two ten-sided die like we did here and figure out, you know, did I succeed or did I fail? I rolled a 33, for instance. And that I don't understand, A, why they would bother to have one column for opening doors and another for bending bars. They both seem pretty similar to me. And then why they're not just doing everything with percentile dice. Uh, it, I think probably because for a while they were just opening doors and they had a lot of six-sided dice, so these that. And then later somebody wanted a different stat for bending bars and now they had more dice and they thought, well, let's use, use percentile dice. Because if I, it's much easier to think in terms of I've got a 33%, that's, or, you know, or I've got a 68% or a 51%. It was much easier, I think, to think in those terms than to break everything down to a six-sided die. So you started to see percentile dice becoming more and more important, not just Ben Bars, but also here in my strength. So I've got little um, ability adjustments, is what they're called, uh, for all of my stats, and, and including you know intelligence and stuff like that. Just like wizards don't get to use percentile dice, Duncan does not get to use the table for magic users. There's an intelligence. There's a general intelligence table. And then there's a table for just magic users because it pertains to spells and stuff like that. And Duncan doesn't know how to cast a spell. So I'm going to pause for a second. And when we return, all of these adjustments will be magically filled in based on my stats. Okay, I filled everything out. And now we see what my character sheet starts to look like when it's uh, populated with all the information about adjustments. In fact, uh, this could get very complex. I, I remember when my friends and I played in the 90s when I was running a birthright campaign, this is what one page of your character sheet would look like. You had all these special abilities and this, the same, you'll, you'll notice if you look closely, these are the same uh, adjustments that Duncan has 20 years before this. In fact, uh, here you'll note my friend Mark, this is his druid character, uh, Rainway, and uh, he, uh, obviously has been killed and then brought back to life because every time that happens, you lose a point of constitution. And I was, a, you know, a bit of a um, dick when it came to running the game, and I would make sure that it, was, it stayed on his... I kept track of everybody's character sheet, and so I would make sure it stayed on his character so you could see the, the passage of time and also, like, you know, what, what he had lost. He also has a 68 uh, percentile strength, which I don't remember. I think something happened to him that granted him... Uh, the the possibility to use fighter strength. I remember some he had some kind of solo adventure, where something cool happened to him. But as you can see, like there were all sorts of things you could track, and including the specific hit and damage modifiers uh, for all of your different weapons and stuff. Well, Duncan's character sheet is pretty straightforward compared to that, but compared to 1974, much more complex. So let's look at what all of this stuff means. Uh, I've got. We already covered strength. I've got three additional languages, thanks to my 12 intelligence. So I picked Elven, Dwarven, and Gnomish. And this is a process whereby you would imagine you're, you're starting off first little character, who he might meet in his adventures and who he would like to be able to talk to. If you met a bunch of gnomes and no one else spoke Gnomish but you, then you could treat with them and you'd have like a, a cool insight to what was going on. Uh, I have a mag I have no magical attack adjustment. What does that mean, magical attack adjustment? Well, it says right here in the player's handbook, it's an adjustment you make to your saving throws against certain kind of mental attacks involving will force. I don't know what that means. That's not a term I've heard before, really. It includes, but these are the spells, by the way, that this works against. Beguiling, charming, beguiling, charm, fear, hypnosis, illusion, magic jarring, which if you've never played this game before, you'd be like, what the hell are they talking about? What is magic jarring? Uh, mass, charming, uh, and phantasmal forces, uh, possession, rulership, suggestion, telepathic attack. So all of these things, uh, you would, if you made a saving throw against to resist them, you would get a bonus if you had a high wisdom. Similarly, if you have a high dexterity, you get a bonus to your saving throws against like fireballs and lightning bolts, anything you can dodge. It says here, and I, that's another thing I'm pretty sure we never played with. Uh, Duncan's dexterity gives him no adjustment to dodging for saving throws against fireballs. It does give him a bonus to his AC, minus one, because remember, armor class is better the lower it is. Constitution is 14. That means I get no bonus to my hit points, but I have an 88% chance to survive uh, what, what's called system shock, which are anytime I'm turned, the rules say, anytime you're turned to stone or polymorphed or anything like that, you have to make a roll and it, you might just die outright. 
And then any attempts to bring you back, like to reverse the process, won't work because you didn't survive. Uh, I guess really the way it would work is you get turned to stone. Now you're dead and a statue. Then your buddy finally figures out a way to get you from stone to back to flesh. And then you make your system shock check to see, do you survive that process? Uh, As opposed to just being killed and raised from the dead, which was possible and had its own chance of survival. Not 100% sure why they would break that out differently. Uh, And it's not like there's any way, like if, if you're... If you have a four, if I have an eighty-eight system shocks, I always have a ninety-two. Right? It's not like these two numbers change independently of each other. A fourteen always means eighty-eight system shock. Always means ninety-two resurrection survival. Uh, with a charisma of thirteen, I can have a five. I can have a maximum of five henchmen. Uh, they are of normal. They're not especially loyal or disloyal to me, and I am a little bit more charismatic than normal. There's a five percent chance that people I meet will be more friendly toward me than they would be toward a random dude who came by. So I get no bonus to my hit points for my constitution. Well, how many hit points do I get? Let's find out. And here's where we find out how many hit points our fighter gets. You'll notice that the entire fighter section in the player's handbook is only about one, two, three. It's like six paragraphs on a chart. Whereas if you check out the druid, he gets an entire page and a bit just to give you an example of how later classes, including the paladin, the paladin gets a ton of stuff, are just more complex and have more interesting abilities than the fighter. This would eventually be perceived as a problem, that fighters were uh, not just simple and straightforward, but actually weaker than wizards after about, I would say, 5th to 7th level. And I think that there is truth to that. I played D&D for many years. I had uh, many high-level fighting class characters. But one of the things that we did when we played back in the 80s was we followed these rules here. When a fighter attains ninth level lord, he or she may opt to establish a freehold. Basically, you get to build a castle or a keep or something. And once you do that, you automatically attract a body of men at arms. You start raising an army. And at that point, your character's ambitions cease to be, hey, let's go loot that dungeon. And they start to be, hey, let's stop that evil king from waging war against these these innocent people. And you become politically motivated or politically aware. And you become a mover and shaker in the world. In fact, the expectation was once you once you established the keep and became a lord, uh, for at least for a, for a fighter, you uh, you retired your character and started playing him almost like an NPC under your control because now he was important. He could sponsor other adventurers. He could change the world. He could change the map of the world by using his army and and conquering or establishing other countries or territories. And wizards did that less. Wizards would do like spell research and stuff like that. So even though yeah, on a purely you know we're going to fight a demon level. Wizards were more effective. Uh, fighters had effectiveness outside the boundaries of combat. And I mean, Fourth Edition, for instance, which comes out in I think 2008, does a great job of designing a game where fighters and wizards and all classes are equally useful at all levels. But one of the things it loses is that awareness of a world outside of combat. There is nothing in 4th edition that deals with politics or castles and keeps or building or attracting armies. And that is, there's nothing wrong with that, especially, you know, in the kind of game you're running. But the tradition that I'm from, we always, we missed that, or at least I missed it. And in fact, it says here, you attract a body of men at arms led by an above average fighter. What does that mean? How many do you get? Well, it doesn't say here, but if you were reading Dragon Magazine at the time, they would release what they called, quote, NPC classes. And some of these were really cool, like the Time Master or the Witch. And they would show in the... And they were really... They they called them NPC classes because they were saying, hey, we haven't playtested this, so it's not balanced or fair. Use it at your own risk. But of course, everyone wanted to play these new classes, especially the, the awesome ones. And they would have charts in there that showed you, hey, when you establish a keep, here, roll on this chart. And see what you get. In fact, when I first started playing D and D, and I I loved this. I, I I thought it was fantastic. I knew nothing about the game 
except the rules and this magazine that my friends handed to me. If I had been playing a month before or a month afterward, I would have had, a, I think, a very different reaction to how the game worked. But uh, I loved the idea of the Paladin in general. And then they came out with a, 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 this article, a plethora of Paladins, that, ha- that reasoned, hey, a Paladin is just a warrior for the church. There are churches for all different kinds of gods, evil gods, neutral gods. Why can't there be Paladins for all of these gods? And I loved that idea. And so it showed you hear what each kind of paladin did they all got different kind of hit points and in fact my first ever character was a lion and he was grossly overpowered but eventually i would play an ill rigger and you can see what kinds of followers the ill rigger would get if he built a keep here's the ill rigger page and I, by the way I, i'm now an old man and I still think that Illrigger is a great, is it's just a badass name for a class. And, you know, you can see that whoever wrote this article, they like, they ran out of names pretty quickly because the Illrigger reaches his name level, his title level at level five. And he becomes an Illrigger and st- stops, you know, getting a new name. But for a little while, he's a grief bringer and an evil forger, uh, which is spectacular. But here's the star of the show. When an Illrigger... When you reach, I guess, fifth level, you you build a keep. And now you're going to roll. In fact, I believe every level you roll to see. The idea being, you're famous now. You built a, Building a keep attracts attention. The adventures you went on before you built your keep, that where you got your money, made you famous. People have heard of you. So you're going to roll. Every time you level up, you're going to roll on this chart. And it was unique to the Illrigger. Other classes got their own chart. And let's see what you get. Like if you rolled, if you rolled a 97, <laughs> you got one to eight fire giants plus females and young. You got like a tribe of fire giants. And fire giants are not a minor creature. Creature They're, they're ridiculously powerful. Uh, you could get a, a wraith or a white or a specter or a ghost. I just, I love that idea of I build a keep and a ghost comes and haunts my keep. And it's, it's a follower of mine. It works for me, right? So this ghost, what a great story for the GM to come up with. Who is this ghost? Uh, why did he, wh- where, where, did, where did he come from? He must have been someone in life. And now he feels a, 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 the strange attraction to go serve my character in his new tower. That's, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, you get all sorts of, cra- I could get 6 to 24 mites. And I don't know why that's a good thing. Do not roll 85 on this chart. Otherwise, you're going to get... Uh, 60, what is that? 66, 64 mites, which I guess like, like termites. I don't know why you would want that when I just put some flea powder on and get rid of them. Uh, you could get 20 to 200 Dwargar evil, evil door plus female. That's important to note. It's not just the men folk that show up. Their entire family has come along, which means uh, presumably over time, you'll get more Dwargar. If, if, if biology has taught me anything, if I just do nothing, eventually I will have many more than 20 to two, 30 to 300 goblins. <laughs> so there's a point where you're done building your keep and you turn around and an entire city of goblins shows up and they're like, Hey, Hey, hey boss, hey, we, we work for you now. I, I love that idea. I, I would, I, I mean, you're an evil character. Why wouldn't goblins come to work for you? A cavalier could work for you, uh, which is great. A, hell ca- a hellhound. How awesome would that be to be an, Ill, an evil, a lawful evil paladin with a hellhound as a pet? That would be just amazing. And you see like Lola, like one to, what is it? There's about a 25, 28% chance that you're going to get some combination of thieves you're either gonna get a tiny thieves guild one many thieves of low level or one thief of relatively high level and you get illusionist and magic users that's just amazing i love this chart i want one of these charts for every class i want the magic user when he builds his tower to roll on this chart and maybe some of the things aren't followers maybe some of the things are like he discovers a new spell i don't know if that makes any literal sense but you know, go crazy. So this is the kind of stuff you expected to happen when you reached your name level. Duncan eventually will get to be seventh, will get to be ninth level. He'll build a keep and he'll become important to the world in a way that a wizard wouldn't be. I remember another tradition that we used, and I don't know where this came from, but I think it was common, was that troops, soldiers liked being led by fighters, did not like being led by magic users. The normal common soldier thought magic was weird. And so we had access. I don't know where these things came from. I think they were just handed down to us over time. We had access to these mass combat rules where if your 
character that was leading the army was a magic user, you had access to spells that could affect battle, but your troops suffered a morale penalty because they were terrified of magic. And that made perfect sense to me then and still makes sense to me now. But the reason we came here was because we wanted to know how many hit points Duncan has. So that means we're going to roll a 10-sided die for hit points. Notice it says for accumulated hit points. I ran into many people over the years that thought that this meant that you rolled 1d10 for at first level and then another 2d10 at second level for a total of 3d10. I know people who thought that it meant at first level you rolled 1d10 and then at second level you rolled 2d10 and that was your new total. Like you, you ignored what you got before. And I was like, that can't be right. You, it can't work that way. It, it could go down. Like you could roll a 10 at first level and then two ones. And people had elaborate explanations for why this was. But this is part of what happens when you write this stuff down in what I think is often overly uh, technical, jargony terms instead of using natural language. Gary hated using natural language if he could come up with, uh, you know, more technical like the, the, the reading these rules was like reading a technical manual and in some cases that's good and in some cases that's bad how many hit points does duncan have well we want him to have a lot but we don't have any control over that it is up to fate eight fate eight hey of course it's good i should have said it's up to uh ben and then i would have got 10 but i didn't so he gets eight hit points uh, i have no bonus for my constitution uh armor class is going to depend on uh what, what armor i buy and i haven't bought that yet my attack matrix, if you remember, the attack matrix was a simple, pretty straightforward way of figuring out what armor class you hit. You would roll a d20, you would add your bonus, and you would look up the results. So, for instance, I rolled 11 plus 1 is 12, which means I had an AC of 8. And that's, you know, that's they would later replace this with, a, I think, a more complex term called Thaco, and we'll explain why I think that's more complex later. Uh, so weapon proficiencies, Duncan gets a certain number of weapon proficiencies. Here we see the chart that tells us how many weapons does each class know how to use, and what kind of penalty do we get if we pick up a weapon we don't know how to use. You'll notice that fighters get they know how to use four different weapons. They can use any weapon. And they are only at a minus two if they pick up a weapon they don't know how to use. Furthermore, they get more proficiencies faster than any class, I guess, except the monk. They get a new weapon proficiency once every three levels. Now, this is an interesting idea, the notion that I only know how to use a couple different kind of weapon, a couple different types of weapons. That makes sense. You train to use different weapons. Uh, and then if I try to use a different weapon, I get penalized. I get penalized for using other weapons. And this idea would persist for quite a long time, even though I think that penalizing players for stuff like that is bad design. Eventually they would fix that in fourth edition. You would have, it, it, essentially they would just flip all of this and say, you get a, you, you know, a cert, how to use a certain number of weapons. And with those weapons, you get a proficiency bonus. And then if you're using a weapon, you don't know how to use, you just roll like normal and don't add anything. So there's, in other words, there's no penalty for using a weapon you don't know how to use. Instead, you get a bonus for using weapons that you do know how to use. I think that's just generally better. So I get four weapons. I know how to use any of them. So let's say I can use a long sword. Long sword. How about longbow? Dagger is always good because you end up in lots of situations where you get, you can ha you have a dagger hidden. And if you, your weapon's taken away from you, you can still use your dagger. Also, daggers can be, in a, in a pinch, they can be thrown. They also make a, a useful tool. And let's, how about a uh, javelin? No, how about a spear? No, let's say, uh, how, how about a halberd? Why would we use a halberd? Well, halberds are long rep weapons. They're pole arms. And that means you can attack from the second rank. I can be a fighter standing behind somebody else. Because I'm a coward, I guess. Who am I going to stand behind? Uh, the wizard. Uh, and then I can use my halberd and attack even though I'm not directly in combat. So I longsword, longbow, dagger, and halberd, and I get a secondary skill. Secondary skills were in the DM's guide, and they were after you were after you learned how to uh, roll your stats or which method you were going to use. There was a list, and you rolled on the list to find out what did I do before I became a fighter. And you'll, if you've seen the other videos, you'll have noticed that this is the first time we have any recognition that there ever was anything to do in the world other than be a fighter, a magic user, a cleric. And it's the beginning of the notion of skills, the idea that there are things to do besides fight. 
And we want to know, how good am I at doing those things? Eventually, the game would get kind of crazy with skills, especially compared to 1974 when they were none, or even 1979 now when we have just this list. Uh, but really, they could have called these professions because you'll notice that uh, it, these aren't these to me, they don't look like skills, especially compared to, for instance, third edition D&D or fourth edition. Does fifth edition have skills? We'll find out. Uh, and I remember my friends and I getting a lot of mileage out of what you, was our secondary skill, what was our profession, and especially at lower levels. You know, you might come across, like you're a mason, you might come across a dungeon or a temple, a ruined temple, and your DM, if you were a mason, would let you make a role, usually intelligence or wisdom, and you might learn something interesting about who built this place or how old it was. And that stuff is super interesting. You know, why not? Let's have it. So what is our, what is Duncan's secondary skill? Let's find out. Let's go back to fantasy grounds and roll percentile dice. We got an uh, 80 and an 80 means, oh, no skill of measurable worth. Crap. Secondary skill, none. Now this is very unusual and I bet you can detect why. Because if you note, this is one of the few charts where like rolling 86 or better would have got me roll twice. I could have two professions. So in other words, again, if I roll really high, good things happen, even though there's nothing like zero, zero is not less likely to come up than nine, six or one, four or three, two. But for some reason, six, you know, all these charts get better as you go up, except this one where there's this big range here of nothing. Just go screw you. You saw you, you were a, you were peasant. You were a beggar. You just asked people to support you. You didn't have a living. Your parents didn't do anything. You come from a long line of people that did nothing. Uh, fine. There's also charts in here for age and height, but uh, I'm not going to use those because we never did. We, we, they were completely inconsequential. I guess there were, there were charts for if you have uh, – when you get really old – your character would start – These are, there were rules for this. When you got really old, your character would lose um, strength and it would gain, you'd gain wisdom and intelligence. You know, but we never used those charts unless something happened to us in the game that caused us to age prematurely. So Duncan has no secondary skill. We've got four proficiencies. And this is his saving throw matrix, which we looked up. And we know this as soon as we say we're making a first level fighter. These have nothing to do with our stats. You'll remember that when we talked about our dexterity and our wisdom, they give us bonus. They can give us bonuses to our saving throws against certain kinds of effects. And remember, just in case you're watching this and you have no idea what a saving throw is, it was a... A, a roll, that's where the word throw comes from. They used to call these, make a throw, because you throw the dice. They could have called them saving rolls. It's a roll you make to save yourself from some effect. A dragon breathes on you, make a saving throw. And usually these were things where the person attacking you didn't have to roll to hit. Like a, a dragon breathes and it affects everybody in an area. Okay, how do we determine does anybody, everyone's going to try and get out of the way of the dragon breath, which ones succeed and which ones fail. That's this chart and different classes were good at different things. So we're almost done. Uh, we have level one experience, none. We have our stats. Uh, we have our age. I think Dunk, I think uh, this is, um, you know, I think this Duncan is 23 and what's his line. I think it's lawful neutral. Let's find out what that means. So here is the section on alignment. And I think for the first time, we now have the nine alignment axes where we have chaos versus law, which we saw earlier. And now we have good versus evil and we combine them. So you can be chaotic, good, chaotic, neutral, chaotic, evil, or lawful, good, lawful, neutral, lawful, evil, and then neutral, 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 good, neutral, evil. And th things have changed a little bit in the way these things are described. Like, for instance, let's, let's read what is Duncan's alignment means. Those of this alignment view regulation as all important, taking a middle road betwixt evil and good. This is because the ultimate harmony of the world and the whole of the universe is considered by lawful neutral creatures to have its sole hope rest upon law and order. Evil and good are immaterial besides the determined purpose of bringing all to predictability and regulation. This is very declarative speech. This is emphatic. 
This is a proscription. This is not a description. This is telling you what you think and what you believe. And as a result, alignment would cause lots of arguments and debates for the next 20 to 30 years. And even now to a, to a limited extent, because previously alignment was just an, uh, a sort of vague uh, outlook on life. There was good. In the, there was the, the civilization versus wilderness, right? The uh, the elves, dwarves, and humans against the monsters, and chaotic was basically the monster alignment. And then there was good versus evil. Good was us, and evil was the bad guys. But now you've got this weird kind of uh, cosmic law that all the different alignments force you to obey. And that caused a lot of problems. I think it's, uh, I don't, I'm not entirely sure why the language changed over time. I don't think the game benefited from it, even though I really like the idea of alignment. And I think that it is a, 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 one of those neat quirks that gives D&D its flavor. And I, I've never had a problem using it in the game. Uh, I've had players that had problems with it, but I, as a GM, it, it never made, it never was, I never, I never used these as these kind of absolute restrictions. I used them purely as uh, guidelines. So now Duncan has an alignment, he's got a name, he's got an age, he's got a level, he's got stats, he's got hit points, he's got uh, an attack matrix, we know what his weapon efficiencies are, uh, we know his saving throws, and now the only thing we're missing is his equipment, and then we'll know what his armor class is and how much damage his weapons do. So where do we find how much gold he has? Here we have money, starting money, and you'll notice that the fighter, the gear-based character, gets the most. He gets 5d4, and the implication being it's times 10, the result, as opposed to the monk, which just gets 5d4. Doesn't get it times anything. Because he's a monk, he's eventually going to become like an extra planar being of perfect form. So why does he need money? Uh, his body is a weapon, Uh quite literally, in, in Dungeons & Dragons. So I get 5d4 times 10 gold, and this is going to be important because it's going to determine whether or not I get really good armor and lots of weapons, or kind of, uh, you know, mediocre armor and only a handful of weapons. One, two, three, four, five. Da -doot. <laughs> three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have 80 gold. That is actually not very much. And I am not going to force you to sit through the process of spending that money. When we return, I will have a nice little list of equipment here. Okay, we've spent our gold, and this is where things get a little interesting, because even though Duncan has the best stats, certainly, of any of the Duncans so far, nearly God Emperor of Dune levels of Duncan, but he he's so he's super good in the stat department, and he's got decent hit points. I rolled an eight, about uh, nearly as good as you can get. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of money, so he doesn't have the awesome equipment some of the early Duncans had. And, in fact, the... The prices change, like the cost of plate mail, for instance, goes from, I don't remember what it was in the early version, but here it's like 400 gold pieces for plate mail. So obviously somebody wrote to Gary and said, Gary, plate mail is not that common and it's super expensive. Uh, but I was not able to afford even like chain, like chain mail would have been 75 80ths of my total value. So I was really only able to afford studded leather. I wasn't even able to afford a longbow. They cost 60 gold. So I got a short bow for 15 gold and that posed a problem. I had to go in and change my weapon proficiencies because it's not clear to me what weapon, uh, it, the, what, what is a weapon proficiency? Like what does it cover? Does, uh, does bow, is it, is, are these four bows here, the composite short, composite long, and then long and short, are they each a different Weapon proficiency? Uh, Matt doesn't know. Maybe you, the listener, know, in which case, please, you know, comment so that we can find out if, if Duncan is stuck forever using a short bow. You'll notice here under, uh, I've listed how much damage, I bought all of these, so I have them listed here in my equipment, and they each have their damage listed, a D8 or one D12, for instance, for a longsword, and that is the damage you do versus... Uh, Small or medium creatures is the first number, and then large creatures. And for some reason, you do more damage against large creatures. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because large creatures have more hit points. And that seems like double dipping. Like, they ha if they have more hit points, but I do more damage, why not just give them normal hit points and I'll do normal damage? Uh, I'm not sure. And you also notice that there are a lot of things in here like uh, a Beck de Corbin that you've never heard of. What's a Bardiche? I bet you don't know. Well, okay, if you played, if you played AD&D, then you're an old man like me and you've probably looked this stuff up. Uh, or maybe you're a, uh, a history, a, a, you know, a medieval weapons nut. What's a Beck de Corbin? Well, it's a beak of the, 
uh, Corby or the Raven or Raven's beak. What's a Bill? Who is Bill Guizarm? You know, what is a Fauchard? Or uh, there's a, just a ton of these things. What's a Guizarm? What's a Guizarm Volge? I'll tell you what they are. And basically, when you look through this list, anything that you're like, what the hell is that? Is a polearm. Uh, and for, so I don't know, Gary must have read a book on pole arms and just went fucking crazy because they're all over the place. A Bill Guise arm even includes a scorpion. Come here. I don't know what, oh, it's, um, scorpion must be another kind of pole arm. I actually literally didn't know what it was until I was making that joke. Uh, so you'll see basically all, uh, well, you know, this includes a bohemian ear spoon. I didn't make that up. That's a real thing in this book and it's probably a real weapon. Uh, so all this crap is all, all these notes, most of this chart is just Gary Gygax has a huge hard on for pole arms. I guess he, you know, the the medieval weapon nerds tend to get hyper-focused on this one weapon was the best weapon. Like the crossbow was the best weapon. And I guess Gary, you know, he thought that the, uh, he thought that the pole arm was the best weapon. Okay, that's cool. There's a ton of them in here, including, if I remember, the glaive. Now, <laughs> you're, depending on your age, when I say that, you may laugh. Because for those of us who were playing D&D in the 1980s, uh, the glaive was a weapon that we only knew it and only ever heard of from a, 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 a great fantasy movie called Krull. And when I say great, I don't mean good or well done. I mean, it was a lot of fun. It had a lot of heart. It didn't make a lot of sense. They spent a lot of money on it. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it because it's kind of a blast. But if I type in crawl glaive, you'll see what we all thought the glaive was. We thought it was this cool, uh, five pointed star that you threw. It was, and it was like Thor's hammer. Like the hero would throw it and it would go out and it would attack stuff. And then it would come back. And it was like Wolverine's claws, too. It was like Thor's hammer and Wolverine's claws because these little pointy things would shoot out, you know, whenever you wanted them to. And obviously, whoever wrote this movie had read a lot of comics. But in point of fact, that's not what a glaive is. If I just go up here and just search, if I remove the term crawl from my search, you'll see what a glaive actually is. Yeah, it's this, basically. Yeah, different Lots of different, again, I mentioned pole arms, lots of different kinds of pole arms. So you can imagine a millions of kids, millions, dozens of kids in the 1980s were hugely disappointed when they found out that they couldn't spend 75 gold and get the awesome magical sci-fi weapon that the hero had in Krull. Uh, you were stuck with a pole arm. Big deal. So what's left? Uh, I don't have my armor class. I have studded leather and I have a shield. And that is sort of interesting because I never really knew. I looked this up while I was doing this. What does a shield do? I always thought it just gave you plus one to your armor class. But there are lots of different shields you can buy. And here it explains that a small shield can be counted against only one attack per round. Larger shields counted against more attacks. The idea being that you were actively using your shield and moving it around to block attacks. And it was easier to do that with a large shield than a small shield. I also liked the fact that attacks from the right flank, which is to say your sword arm, and against your rear always negate the advantage of the shield. Now, that's a level of detail that somewhat surprises me because uh, I don't think we ever used that. We kind of had our own flanking rules, which pretty closely resemble the rules that everyone was using for third edition D&D. And in fact, a lot of the third edition rules, I think, come from popular house rules that people have been playing with for 20 years. Because this stuff starts to get a little noodly, like the positioning of the different combatants. You know, the guy attacking you on the right he's attacking a different armor class and the guy attacking behind you is attacking a different armor class because you don't have your shield there to defend it. Oh, look at this. I could buy a pig. I just noticed uh, there's a whole section here on livestock. I could buy a chicken. I could buy a cow. I could buy a donkey. I know people that own chickens, by the way, but that just buy chickens because they have space and they want eggs and they get them. And they only cost, it only cost Liz three copper pieces for her chicken. I can get a piglet and I can get a piglet or a pig. A piglet is one gold, and a pig is... Th- okay, I got an idea. A pig is three gold, so here's what we're going to do. We're Screw being fighters. Uh, we don't want to do that. We're not going to buy any of that equipment. We're just going to go to the pig market. And we're going to buy piglets for one gold, and then raise them, and sell, and just feed them slop, because they're pigs, they'll eat anything. And then we'll sell them for a 300% markup. 
and we will just make bank and we'll become pig farmers and we'll get rich <laughs> or I get a songbird for four copper pieces. That's amazing. Of course, the only part of this that was really relevant was you could buy a horse, which was nice. And if you had a war horse, there were rules, which is 10 times as expensive as a normal horse. Uh, there were rules for riding your horse into battle and your horse could make its own attacks if it had been trained for war. And I guess it's that training that costs all that money. Uh, heavy war horse, 300 gold, light war horse. Anyway, armor class for uh, studded leather and shield is six. Not very good. And that's the difference between Duncan the Fourth and the other Duncans. Is the other Duncans had plenty of gear and often had as much money to buy as much gear as they wanted. Whereas Duncan the Fourth has great stats, but he's pretty easy to hit. Now, again, that is a solvable problem. Within one to two levels, Duncan will have much better armor. And remember, there's nothing stopping him other than the cash from wearing plate mail. So eventually he'll go through Castle Amber and he'll find the magic suit of plate mail in there or something. And he'll come out and his armor class will drop like a stone, which is great. There's lots of stuff that we could write down for our character, but which we don't. For instance, this entire chart we don't use because holy crap. The point of this chart, and I think we saw this in one of the earlier videos, is that different weapons were useful against different armor classes. And again, this is code. Uh, armor class of, I think, uh, armor class of three really meant chain and shield, or I think it was maybe five, I'm not sure. And so you would use your battle axe. Again, it told you like how long it was. It was, what was that, four feet? I don't know what that number, though. yeah, four feet. And it has a speed factor. We'll explain that in a second. And then it told you if you were using a battle axe against a lightly armored foe, you got a bonus to uh, to hit their armor class. The armor, your, is what, your armor class? Their armor class? Hang on one second. You know, I'm not entirely sure how this chart works. Is it that if I'm, if I'm using a battle axe against somebody of armor class 10, my armor class goes up by two? I am harder to hit because I'm wielding a bat. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm sure somebody in the comments, I hope somebody in the comments is going to explain this because I looked through the rules. I wasn't actually able to find it. It might be in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Speed factor was measured, I believe, in segments. And here we start to get noodly once again. This whole chart is just an exercise in you know, like progressive rock level. Rick Wakeman on keyboards, Keith Emerson levels of noodliness where... A, a combat round where in like third edition and fourth edition on your turn, you can move and attack. That's basically it. Whereas here attacking took a different number of segments. A round was broken down to 10 segments. And if I, I you would roll a six sided die to determine where in the round you would go. So I would roll. I, so for instance, I would say, okay, it's my initiative. And I go on like segment six of round one. That's when I start my turn. So then if I attack, with a battle axe with a speed factor of seven, it's gonna take seven uh, segments to swing my battle axe, which means my attack won't land until you know, six plus seven is 13, which is, uh, there are only 10 segments in a round, so on the third segment of the next round, my attack will land. Holy crap. But that m allowed you to create a difference between otherwise similar weapons. You had stuff like the glaive, versus a glaive guise arm. One was one segment faster than the other. And spells had segments. Certain spells would take a certain number of segments to cast. And so you and I might get the same initiative, but you, and you and I, you cast a spell. So we would otherwise act simultaneously, but you cast a spell that takes five segments to cast. I swing a weapon that takes three segments to swing. My sword is going to hit you before your spell goes off. And I might interrupt your spell casting. And that was another big part of the game. I don't know anyone that used, I literally know no one who used this stuff except occasionally as an experiment and they gave it up. Like, and when I say no one, I mean, I've known hundreds of people. I mean, people at convention, gaming conventions, people, ever, people I work with, no one ever used this stuff. I, I, I think these guys went a little crazy. And in fact, it's not in, as far as I know, any other edition. So that's it. That is Duncan the Fourth. That is Advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, 1979. The next time we meet, we will probably make a character in second edition unless there is a great hue and cry from you to make a character using the Unearthed Arcana. Remember that we're only making a fighter, and I don't think fighters... Ch I think all the options in the Unearthed Arcana were more spells 
There was the cavalier class. There was the thief assassin. Uh, you know, some of this is uh, the barbarian, some of it very cool stuff. I don't think any of it was really relevant to somebody like Duncan. I have, I got percentile strength with Duncan the fourth, uh, happily. I rolled an 18, astonishingly. I speak like four different languages. I've got decent stats. I've got decent hit points, but I've got a crap armor class. So I've got to watch out until the, you know, after the first or second adventure, Duncan will be fine. And, uh, you know, I've got standard gear. And this is about as complex, I think, as the game would get. Maybe second edition will make it more complex. Uh, certainly by the time we get to 2.5, where we had skills and powers, which was, a, was an expansion for second edition, I think things got maybe a little noodlier. We'll see. 